everyone, welcome to an episode of Kevin Plays Perry Mason and the Case of the Mandarin Murder. Uh, we're going down a little memory lane here. Um, I know I said in my last video, which was uh, the Assassin's Creed 2, uh, at the end of that I said I was going to start some Batman, and I did start Batman, Batman Ar Arkham Asylum, and it felt... And I'm pl playing through that. I'm c currently playing through that. But it's, it, before I start doing that kind of video, uh, you know, the gameplay is still feels similar to Assassin's Creed. So I want to do just something totally different. Something uh, that I'm f uh, a little familiar with. Uh, this is... This game has some nostalgia for me. It was my first computer game ever during the 80s. Uh, in the 80s is when my family got our first computer. And uh, this game came with it. I think my dad was a Perry Mason fan and he got this game. He got other games too for us. But uh, this one I remember the most because I, I played it the most and I could not solve it it was my first really text based game role playing game and uh, I could not solve who the mur I could well I figured out I figured on I had suspicions on who the murderer was but you, what you have to do is make them break down in court and you have to ask specific questions in court and, and you know a certain order and um, I could not get this person to crack. So um, now this game's available. Well, you know, it's online and uh, you can run it through DOSBox. And, uh, um, you know, and then there's walkthroughs on YouTube. So I looked up the walkthrough and I'm going to get some vengeance from my childhood. I'm going to solve this game and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so for those of you who might not know who Perry Mason is. Okay, so Perry Mason, uh, there's a, a, a TV series on HBO HBO right now called, uh, you know, called Perry Mason, and he's basically um, a defense attorney, uh, solves, uh, uh, basically he represents people who are innocent of a crime and who are accused of, you know, basically murdering people, but they're innocent, and he, he uh, investigates uh, finds out who the guilty person is and he usually has them break down in court and they you know they're on the witness stand you know trying to give uh, uh, you know trying to say your client was the murderer but he he turns it around and they then they break down and say yes yes I killed that person yes I did you know and uh, uh, you know Perry Mason was the man so uh, but this game, uh, but originally Perry Mason was a 60s, uh, TV show and, uh, which is basically what the HBO series is based off of. And, um, this game is based off of that same 60s TV show. And so it's a little dated. Um, and, uh, um, let me see here. And. Yeah, it, yeah. So it's a little dated. This game came out in the '80s, uh, you know. But you know, based the game's based in the '60s still, and uh, you know, we'll just go through and play it, see how it goes, and see if I could get a little vengeance from my childhood. So, you know, we'll start here. I think uh, Perry's talking to his secretary, Della, and so we'll start here. You know, he says, "Because I'm a hunter, Della." Some men get their thrills in life out of standing up to a charging lion or tiger. Well, some like to sh some like to shoot small birds. Some just like to hunt, not for what they kill, but for the thrill of hunting. Well, I hunt murderers. I didn't really get that, you know, when I when I was watching the reruns of the Perry Mason show. Um, I felt that he either I think he felt sorry for his uh, clients and that he wanted to uh, basically find out what the truth was I don't think he specifically went after murderers to put them in jail you know because I think if he had this attitude he would be a DA you know but uh, um, not or 
yeah, district attorney. But um, I guess, but instead he's a defense attorney. So I don't think he actually hunt murders. I think he's, you know, he just wants to find the truth. But anyway, I don't know. Anyway, that's my own opinion. Anyway, so it says, welcome to the case of the Mandrian murder. Type start to begin or skip to jump right to the case. So we'll start. Let's get this show on the road. get that cool 80s music and i gotta step away for a bit i'll be right back mic off Mike on. Okay, I'm back. And I think you all have time to read through all that, so I won't read it to you. So let me see here. We'll hit that. And then Laura Cap goes, Oh, thank you, Mr. Mason. I knew you'd understand. I'm sure we could stop Victor from divorcing me. Victor and I need to spend some more time together. I haven't seen him since I entered the sanatorium a year ago. I know it must have been hard on him. Laura's voice trails off. She looks at you, but her eyes never focus. If Victor, if Victor doesn't love me anymore, I just don't know what I'll do. Laura glances nervously at her watch. I have to leave now. Can I call you tomorrow? Sure. A look of relief sweeps across Laura's face. You'll hear from me early tomorrow morning. I'll call you after my appointment with Dr. Erickson. Laura slips out of your office. Saturday morning. Normally you be sleeping. If only you haven't fallen behind so far in your work. The door to your office opens and in walks Della, smiling mysteriously. Looks like to me you've had yourself a female visitor last night, Perry. Entertain a new client? Yes. You explain last night's events. Well, that it makes sense. Laura's initials match those on the handkerchief I found in my office this morning. For a second, I thought you were interviewing for new secretaries behind my back. Della winks, then returns to her office. Moments later, a call comes through from Della. It's Lieutenant Craig Perry. He says he's calling about Laura Cap. I'll put him through. The phone begins to ring. Pick up the phone. Pick up phone. Now we get to use our 60s voice. Trag here, Mason. Laura Cap is dead. Or not Laura, Victor. <laughs> Oops, wrong one. Victor Cap is dead. He's been murdered. Murdered, I tell ya. Shot in the back. We found his wife, Laura Cap, a few feet away from his body with a pistol next to her hand. I betcha she did it. That dame, I betcha. I don't know. That's my 60s voice there. I don't know. Anyway, has her fingerprints all over it, Mason. She claims you're her lawyer, Mason. If you want, you could go to the victim's apartment, Mason, where he was murdered, Mason. Sergeant Holcomb is there to keep an eye on you, Mason. See you in court, Mason. You hang up the phone. All right, so let's go to the apartment. Go to apartment. As you are walking out the door, Della calls to you. I call Paul Drake Perry. He'll catch up with you later. You hop into your black sedan and head over to the St. James Apartments. Arriving at the scene of the crime, 
you rush up to Victor Cap's apartment. Do -do 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 -do. Yes, God love that old computer music. You are in the foyer of Victor Cap's penthouse. The polished hardwood floor ends into a small flight of steps leading down into a spacious modern living room. Looking around, you see a den, a bathroom, and a dog pen. A closet opens off of the right foyer wall. Across the living room, you see a dining room and a kitchen which have been quartered off by the police. Sergeant Holcomb watches you suspiciously from the living room. All right, so, okay, go to living room. The symmetry of the living room is ruined by an overturned statue and the chalk outline of a corpse. Gruesome reminders of why you are here. Golden leaves lie scattered around the broken statue. Nearby stands a card table, two chairs, and a breakfast bar. There is a light switch on the wall. Across the room stands a huge sofa atop a rare oriental rug and a coffee table which face towards a brick fireplace. A wet bar lined with bottles stands along the same wall as the fireplace. Okay. Examine card table. Top of the card table you see a document. Get document. You wait until Holcomb is looking it the other way and slide the document into your jacket breast pocket. So, yes, we are going to steal evidence at the scene of a crime to help our case. You know, this was the 60s. This, things were way looser back then. Okay. So, let me see. Examine document. You briefly leaf through the staple pages. It is a draft of a contract between Julian Masters and Victor Cap. Reading a little more closely, you discover that the contract calls for Julian to buy out Victor's shares in the Argos Cafe. Okay. Uh, let's see. Examine coffee table. The table is made of mahogany on the tabletop. You see a half-smoked clove cigarette, a highball glass covered with fingerprint dust, and a water stain at the other end of the table. Holcrum calls to you. The fingerprints on the highball glass were caps. Don't mess with anything on that table, Mason. Get cigarette. Got the cigarette without Holcrum noticing. Examine cigarette. Examine glass. Catch a faint whiff of wine. Examine rug. The rug looks to be a restored antique. On the rug, near one end of the coffee table, you find the shards of a broken wine glass over a spot on the rug. See if we can examine the spot. Nope. Okay. Okay. What else? Da da da. Ah, yeah. Car table, two chairs, breakfast bar. Salmon. Breakfast bar. Bar's exquisite teak is marred by a bullet hole. The hole goes in a few inches, but there is no sign of the bullet. Hole crumb watches over you. Examine the hole. Nope. Okay. Um, what else? Examine wet bar. Sorted liquors. That's nothing there. Let's look one more time. Uh... Examine outline. Line depicts a person lying with the head and outstretched arms pointing towards the kitchen and his legs pointing towards the foyer. Examine statue. Ooh. The statue depicts a woman being transformed into a tree. The description at the base of the statue reads Daphne, I guess, Daph. 
D A P H N E, daphne. Go and leaves lie scatter on the floor. Oh. Take leaf. You pick up the leaf off the floor, discover that it's merely gold plated, and put it in your pocket. Leaf is. Mm, okay. Nothing there. Let's look one more time. Da da da. Across the room stands a huge sofa. We looked all there. We looked at the coffee table. All right. Go to pen. The dog pen is a room about eight feet by eight feet. In the far corner, you see a water dish and some large bones. In another corner, you see a headless plastic doll. The door is scratched badly. On the inside, you can feel Holcrum's eyes hot on your back. Examine. Scratch. The scratches in the door are deep. You notice traces of blood in and around the scratches. From the living room, Holcomb shouts to you that dog really wanted to get out of his pen. He must have cut himself pawing at the door. Okay. Uh, get blood. You scrape off some of the dry blood and put it at the sample into a handkerchief. All right. All right, that's all we get there. Go to den. The den is filled with a contemporary chairs and sofa. You can see an expensive stereo and television. One wall is lined with bookshelves. In another corner stands a pot of palm tree. There is a glass door which leads out to the terrace and another door which is closed. Okay. Salmon tree plant. Looks to be in good health. Suddenly your eye is caught by a single shiny earring next to the plant. Get earring. You drop the earring in your pocket. Examine earring. Earring is a golden hoop. Okay, examine bookshelf. The bookshelf is covered with an assortment of books from cookbooks to browning. One book is pulled out slightly. Examine book. <laughs> da -da. As you page through the book, you notice a letter tucked between the pages. You return the book to the shelf. Get letter. Stuff the letter in your pocket. Read letter. Victor, I have given you everything I can, heart and soul. When will you call on me again? Margot. Okay. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. Da, 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 da. Examine door. Door to Victor Cast's bedroom is locked shut. You cannot get in. Okay. Go to terrace. For the splendid view, Ellie, the terrace is empty of furniture. Go to foyer. Oops, go to foyer. There we go. Okay. See, dead. We've been there. Bathroom. Nothing's in the bathroom. Dog pen. Closet. Closet's locked. I tried it before. Across the living room, you see a dining room. Yeah, we can't get there. Okay. That's it. We apartment. You leave the apartment, hop into your, the elevator, and make your way out into the street. Standing by the building's front door not, is none other than Paul Drake, your right-hand man. Della said I'll f I'd find you here, Perry. Sounds like you really got a hot case on your hands. Tell me, do you think she's innocent? Yes, I do. Yeah, that's what I figured. Look, well... I was waiting for you. I checked out the apartment building. Everyone who 
uh, walked into the building, had to get by the doorman, Ed Burns. I tried to find him, but Burgers already got him wrapped up as a witness. We won't see him until he gets called to the stand. I did manage to find this, though. Paul takes out a sheet of paper uh, from his jacket pocket and offers it to you. Take paper. Okay, you take the paper from Paul. It's the guest list for the night of the murder. I'm told that every non-resident that entered the building on Friday night has his or her name on this list, including Laura Cap. Paul looks down at his watch. I don't know about you, Perry, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done before uh, you walk into that trial. What would you like me to investigate? So we have to... Okay, so Paul, comma... Investigate uh, blood sample. I'll get right on it. If I don't see you before, I'll meet you in court. Paul hops off his sedan and speeds off. Okay, you're standing outside of Victor Cap's apartment. From here, you can... We uh, Let's go to prison to interview Laura Cap. To prison. Okay, you pick up the phone on your side to begin questioning your client. Okay, wait. The prison sergeant takes the receiver on the other side of the glass and interrupts you. Mr. Mason, before you begin, I should warn you that your client has been heavily sedated. She makes sense for a little while, but she drifts off at the drop of a hat. I'll leave the room now, but I'm going to stay close by... By in case is close. Bleh. I'll stay close by in case she starts ranting and raving again. The sergeant hands the receiver to Laura and leaves through the same door she came in. Laura, what the heck are you doing? Heck is not in the vocabulary list. We'll just wait, see if she says anything. Mr. Mason, please, I can't remember. I, I know I went to see Victor that night. I was tired. Victor was glad to see me. I didn't kill him, Mr. Mason. I loved Victor. Something came at me. I fainted. I bought the gun downtown, but I never used it. I just wanted to scare him. Laura stops speaking and closes her eyes. Here, let's see if the scare him, question mark. Scare is not in the vocabulary list, but she used it. Okay, just wait. Margot Dubois was chasing Victor. I was in the hospital. There was nothing I could do. I don't remember anything about Friday night. I don't know how I got in Victor's apartment. Wait! There is one thing I remember. I was standing in the living room talking to Victor. He told me he loved me. He said he never loved her. That she meant nothing to him. He always intended to come back to me. He said he was going to dump her and we'd make a new start. Then something dark came at me. There was an explosion. Mr. Mason, please, I feel dizzy. Laura stares blankly off into space. Oh. Uh, wait. All right. I didn't do it, Mr. Mason. Why won't anyone believe me? I, I can't tell you anymore, Mr. Mason. I just don't know what happened. I was in Victor's apartment. That's all I remember. You've got to find out for me, Mr. Mason. You've got to help me. Laura stands up and begins pleading for help, pounding on the glass screen. Help me! Help me, Mr. Mason! Help me! The sergeant enters and leads her away. That's all, Mr. Mason. Like I said, this one's not playing with all her marbles, marbles on deck, if you know what I mean. 
By the way, we got a message for you from Della Street. She said someone sent a brief description of the state's witnesses on over to your office. If you're going back there, please say hello to Paul for me. That rake. Yeah, what a rake. Otherwise, I'm sure I'll see him in court. Okay. So, go to office. You are back at your office behind your desk. Neither Paul or Della are in. Your desk is covered with files. There is a note from Paul penciled in, penciled on the top file. Chief, my operatives did a little snooping around and came up with information about Burgess's witnesses. All eight of them. Trag, Dorset, Crossman, Burns, Miller, Julian Masters, Suzanne Masters, and Dubois. Plan on giving the... Sort of testimonies that district attorneys dream of. Berger probably thinks he's got this one wrapped up. From the look of it, we're going to have our work cut out for us. I left you files of their probable testimony against Laura. Dell and I went to lunch. Happy reading, Paul. So, yeah, so, yep, yeah, so basically it's a good idea to write down all these witnesses. And uh, because what you're going to do is, uh, during court, you're going to have Paul investigate each one of these witnesses uh, just before they come up. So you're going to, and so he'll be going back and forth uh, in and out of court, and you're going to have to remember who's coming up next. So it's a good idea to write down all these witnesses in this order, and uh, all that stuff. So let's read, read trag file Trag will testify about how Victor was shot in the back and was found sprawled over a statue in his living room he'll say he found Laura in delirious state in the foyer only 16 feet from Victor's body apparently the gun was only a few feet away from Laura's hand read Dorset Sorry, arranging my notes. Dorset file. Dorset's ballistic, a uh, ballistics expert, and he'll testify that the two bullets found in the apartment were definitely fired from the gun found near Laura's hand. Okay, read. Crossman's file. He'll, he's a medical examiner. Crossman will testify that Victor died from internal hemorrhaging caused by the bullet wound. He estimates the time of death at around 1.30 a.m. Read Burns file. Burns is a doorman at the St. James apartment where Victor lived. He'll state that Laura showed up at the apartment at around 1.20 a.m and went up to see Victor. He'll also say she was the only person registered to see Victor during the course of the night. Read Miller. You know what, before I do that, let's read paper. Okay, so David Smith. So you got people coming in now at 10, 10.30. 1030, 1040, and da da da. And then from 12 to 1230, there's a gap between 1230 and 120. Interesting. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people, including Laura. Okay. All right. So where were we at? Burn. We were at Burns. Okay. Miller. Read Miller file. I'm not kidding, Perry. This guy gives me the willies. He went to chef school with Victor and is is a friend of Laura's. He'll state there was something going on between Victor and Margot Dubois, the head chef of the Argos. Read. Julian. File. Julian Masters. Masters is Victor's partner in the Argos Cafe. Apparently, he bankrolled the place. He'll testify that Laura Cap was slightly loony. He'll also say that Victor knew Laura had been released from the institution on Friday and was worried that she might attack him or something. Read Suzanne. File. 
Suzanne Masters, she's Julian's wife. Suzanne will testify that she saw Laura Friday afternoon. She'll say Laura was acting kind of crazy and was carrying a gun in her purse. Read Margot file. Victor's head chef at the Argo. She'll testify about her relationship with Victor and about the threat Laura made against her life on the day of the murder. And that's it. Let's go to court. Several weeks pass as you work hard to prepare your case. Finally, the big day comes and you are in court. Della is by your side and Hamilton Berger prepares to make his opening speech. Let's use our 60s voice again. Your Honor and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, three weeks ago on a Friday night at approximately 1.30 in the morning, Victor Cap was shot in the back. Shot in the back, I say. When the police arrived, they found the defendant in the apartment. The prosecution will prove to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, without a shadow of a doubt, that the defendant was the only person who could have fired the lethal bullet. We will hear from Lieutenant Traig, the investigating officer at the apartment. We will also hear the testimonies of ballistics expert Bill Dorsett and medical examiner Jack Crossman, who will confirm that the gun found near the defendant's hand killed Victor Cap. Ed Burns, the doorman at the building, will testify that he saw the defendant enter the building shortly before the crime was committed. Russell Miller, an associate of Mr. Cap's and Julian Masters, the uh, descendant's business partner, yeah, d uh, business partner, not descendant. Uh, deceased, it should be like the deceased business partner. I don't know, anyway. Will aid us in explaining the defendant's motives. Suzanne Masters, Julian's wife, saw a gun in the defendant's purse. Lastly, we will hear the testimony of Margot Dubois, who worked for Victor Cap as the head chef. She will tell us of the threat made on her own life by the defendant just hours before the murder. After hearing these testimonies, you will only you will be convinced that only the defendant had means, motive, and opportunity to vil kill Victor Cap. Berger's voice booms with the authority of a master of ceremonies. For my first witness, I would like to call Lieutenant Trag. A man as tall as you stands up and shuffles towards the witness stand, his head th uh, thrust slightly forward, his long, firm mouth twisted in a slightly whimsical smile, yellowed by years of cigar smoking. He wears a suit that is at least five years out of fashion. Berger strolls over to Trag and Grimm's. Lieutenant Trag, when did you join the police force? So at this point, you either could just say A for answer, uh, let, or you could object to the question. So let's answer. I joined the police force 20 years ago. I've been chief of homicide for the past four years. My record is impeccable. Did you investigate this murder? Yes, curtly replies the detective. Describe your investigation. The lieutenant replies slowly and deliberately like an experienced witness. We discovered Victor Cap dead, shot in the back, sprawled over a fallen statue. Laura Cap lay 16 feet away from the corpse. We found her on the steps by the front door. She was delirious. The district attorney eyes narrow with interest. Did you find a gun in the apartment? Yes, we found a Colt 380 government special Mark IV automatic about six inches from the defendant's hand. The gun had recently been fired. Further investigation revealed that the gun had been purchased on the day of the murder by the defendant uh, from a gun dealer in downtown Los Angeles. Her fingerprints were the only ones found on the gun. Did the murder fire the gun near the victim? Let me see here. Let me look at my notes. Objection. That is an objection if I ever heard one. On what grounds? Unqualified. Objection sustained, agrees the judge. Ha 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 ha. 
Did you find the bullets? You notice that Paul has returned and approaches you. Let me see here. Okay, Paul quietly sits down next to you. I don't know what to make of this, Chief. I did blood tests on the blood in the closet, and it turns out that it was Victor's blood, not the dog's. Paul sticks the report from the blood test into your hand. Ooh, wonder if I could read the report. The report is a blood test analysis of the blood found in the dog's pen as compared with Victor's blood. The test concludes that the blood types are identical. Okay. Will them answer? Yes. Where did you find the bullets? We found one in the ceiling directly above where we found the defendant and one across... Oh! Crud, we have to send Paul out to investigate some other stuff. Okay, hold on a sec. We found one in the ceiling directly above where we found the defendant and one across the room embedded in the breakfast bar. The bullet uh, found in the bar had traces of blood on it. Okay, your witness counselor. Maybe I could still have Paul investigate. And let me see here. Yeah, investigate Burns. Paul uh, takes out a notepad, jots down a note to himself, then quietly slips out of the courtroom. All right, Treg. Did you test the blood? Question mark. We found a puddle of blood underneath the body. Surprisingly, we didn't find any splattered blood beyond the immediate vicinity of the body. The blood on the floor was tested along with the blood found on the bullet. Both blood samples match the blood type of the victim. Okay. Introduce report as evidence. After laying the foundation for the evidence, you hand it to Berger, who looks at it briefly and gives it to the court reporter. Judge Northrup accepts the evidence and says this report is to be entered in ed evidence. Show report. So whenever music plays during court, that's a good thing. So Treg looks sheepishly in the direction of the district attorney. Well, uh, oi gewalt, that's a good one, counselor. It was apparent to everyone there was the blood on the door. It was apparent to everyone there, were there that the blood on the door was from the dog's injured paw. We didn't think a blood test was necessary. The jury seems oppressed. Treg, where did you get your badge from a Cracker Jack box? The word badge is not on the vocabulary list. Well, then, fine. No further questions. Several jurors watch you expectantly. Ha ha! The district attorney stands up for my next witness. I would like to call Mr. Bill Dorsett. Bill Dorsett lifts himself out of his chair and approaches the witness stand. He is about 40 years old, balding, and about 25 pounds overweight. His dark eyes are furrowed in a serious, knowing look. Hamilton Berger turns his attention to the witness. Mr. Dorsett, what do you know about ballistics? A great deal, sir. I have been in ballistics now for 15 years. The district attorney walks over to his table and picks up two plastic bags encasing a gun and some bullets. Your Honor, I would like to introduce these bullets and this gun as evidence. The judge peruses, peruses the contents of the bags then turns to you. Mr. Mason, do you have any objections to entering this gun and these bullets into evidence? No. 
Very well, then, th says the judge. This gun is to be entered into evidence at State's Exhibit A and the bullets at State's Exhibits B. But wait, I submitted the report first. Shouldn't my report be A? And then the gun be B and C? But okay, never mind. Uh, Berger turns his attention back to Bill Dorsett. Do you, well, that's the state's. Okay, now I answer my own question. <laughs> okay, because we, we did defense's uh, evidence. This is the state's evidence. So, okay, Berger turns his attention back to Bill Dorsett. Do you recognize this gun? Let me look at my notes here. Okay. Dorset studies the gun carefully for a moment, then says, yes, I do. It is a Colt Government 380 M4 automatic. That gun fired the bullet which killed Victor Cap. How do you know about the gun? It's easy by comparing the scratches on the bullet exhibit B to the scratches on a test bullet fired from the gun exhibit A. It is possible to determine whether the bullet was indeed fired from the weapon entered as exhibit A. Uh, Mr. Dorsett, would you call this automatic a ladies' gun? Objection. That is sexist. On what grounds? Leading the witness. Objection sustained, agrees the judge. Berger shows the bag with the bullets to Dorsett. Did this bullet kill Victor Cap? Objection. On what grounds are you objecting? Unqualified. Qualified. Objection sustained. Could the defendant shoot a man from 15 feet? Give me a second. Objection. How do you know the defendant did it? Um, unqualified. Okay. Jackson sustained, agrees the judge. The district attorney is momentarily flustered. Permit me to rephrase the question, Your Honor. Berger turns forcefully toward the witness. Mr. Dorsett, could the average person shoot a man from 15 feet? Let me see here. Paul Drake walks in and stands before you. All right. Uh... Paul quickly sits down next to you. Get this, Perry. Before Ed Burns started work at the St. James apartment, he had been arrested in connection with a burglary ring. The uh, police couldn't pin anything on him, so they just let him go. He started at the St. James apartments 10 years ago, and his record has been clean since. Good. So, Paul, investigate... Uh, who's next on the list here? Miller. Okay. Okay, Chief. I'm on my way faster than you could say Jack Robinson. In one fluid motion, Paul lifts himself out of his seat and makes for the door. Hmm. I don't know if that's, uh... Okay, never mind. Anyway answer. Well, I'm confident that a person who's never shot a gun in his or her life could hit a person at 15 feet with a cold 380. The district attorney shuffles back to his seat. Your witness counselor, no further questions. A few jurors look back at you sympathetically. The district attorney bows his head respectfully in your direction and calls his next witness. The prosecution would now like to call Jack Crossman. Dr. Crossman is tall and thin with hawkish eyes, a sharp, defined nose, and wire rimmed glasses. He walks sluggishly to the witness stand as if he had not slept well in days. On his way over to the witness stand, Berger smiles at the jury, then turns back to the witness. Dr. Crossman, where do you work? Before answering, the doctor clears his throat. <coughs> I am a medical examiner at the county coroner's office. I did, I did the autopsy on Victor Cap. Describe your expertise in forensic pathology. Uh, 
The doctor grins, well, if I do say so myself, I'm considered an expert in my field. I have medical degrees from Tufts and UCLA and la 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 and an official certification by the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. Yeah. See, I have papers. Crossman. Dr. Crossman, how did Victor Cap die? Let me look at my notes. Okay, answer. The doctor clears his throat again and speaks as if he is lecturing uh, the courtroom. Mr. Cap was killed by a bullet which entered his back and passed through his body. The wound ruptured a number of organs, including the kidneys. He died within a few minutes from internal hemorrhaging. Did the murderer shoot the victim from the stairs? Objection. On what grounds? That would be unqualified. Objection. Oh, come on. Oh, because I spelled it wrong. Objection. Unqualified. There we go. What? Wow. Okay, hold on. Oh. That was, oh, wrong one. Objection. Leading. There we go. Ha <laughs> ha. Objection sustained. Oopsie. Okay. Anyway. Permit me, permit me to rephrase the question. Your Honor says an irritated district attorney. Did the murderer shoot Victor Calf from a close range? Let me see. Answer. Judging by the size of the wound, I would say that the murderer was standing about 20 feet away from the victim. When did Victor Cap die? You notice that Paul returned. He approaches you. Uh, he he quietly sits down next to you. It seems that our Mr. Miller knew Victor for quite some time. He met Victor at the Culinary Institute of America, but dropped out after a few months. His transcript revealed that he would have probably failed anyway. After CIA, he moved to L.A., where he gained a solid reputation as a restaurant critic, writing a weekly column in Epicure Today magazine. But a year ago, he left his job, and he hasn't printed a review since. Paul, investigate. Let me see where we at next. Julian Masters. Gotcha, Chief Paul Drake has for the door. Della, call the magazine. I'll do my best, Chief Della leaves to use the phone. And we'll let him answer. The doctor sighs. One can never be too sure about these things. I would say that the time of death was around 1.30 a.m., give or take an hour. Dr. Crossman, did you find any signs of struggle? I think I'm, I'm going to allow that. Yeah. A. Ah, now that's an easier question to answer. I found several small cuts and contusions on the victim's body, but these were caused by the victim's collision with the statue in the apartment. All the evidence I have points to the fact that the victim had no idea he was to, about to be shot. Berger stomps back to a seat. Your witness, counselor. All right, let me see here. Uh, what was the bullet's angle of entry? The angle at which the bullet entered the body was very slight. It is unlikely that the murderer shot from an elevation of more than a foot. The victim was shot in the middle of the back. The hole was quite large, which indicates a close range. But since I didn't find any traces of powder burns, it is safe to assume that the victim was shot from several feet away. Della enters the courtroom and returns to her seat. 
Besides you, our call turned out some interesting stuff, Perry, apparently. Da, 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 da. Miller was fired from the magazine. It seems Miller begged to review the Argos, then gave it a horrible review, despite the restaurant's overwhelming popularity. When Victor read the review, he was furious. He called the editor, told him how jealous Russell had always been of Victor, and insisted that he fire Russell. It seems that Miller lost not only his job, but his reputation as well. He hasn't gotten a review published since he left. Della places a signed disposition sent from... Uh, the editor of Epicure today concerning the firing of Russell Miller in your hand. All right. All right. Read deposition. Deposition states that Russell was fired from Epicure for using his position as critic to unjustly attack the Argos Cafe. Okay. Okay, what else? Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. Describe the cuts. There were some minor contusion and cuts on the victim's body, which suggests that he collided with the statue. Some of these cuts did not bleed. This indicates that the victim hit the statue after he was shot for once... A human heart stops beating. Blood ceases to issue out of open wounds. Okay. No further questions. <coughs> a few jurors look back at you sympathetically. Hamilton Burglar slowly stands up. For my next witness, I would like to call Mr. Ed Burns, a small squat man with slicked hair, Wearing a baggy flannel suit and cheap aftershave shuffles up to the witness stand. He grimaces nervously as he takes his oath and sits down. District Attorney smiles reassuringly at the witness. Ed, where do you work? I'm a doorman at St. James Apartments, he sputters. Did Victor live in your building? Yes, sir, you sure did. Did you see the defendant on Friday night? Yes, sir. She showed up at the apartment around 1.20 a.m. saying she wanted to see Mr. Cap. Describe the defendant's arrival to the apartment building. She looked real pale and sick, and I thought to myself that she was going to faint. So then I sat her down on the couch in the lobby. You see, oh, sat her down on the couch in the lobby, you see, and made her register. After that, I left her to rest and catch her breath. Ed sighs, then pauses to think for a few seconds. A few minutes later, I went to check on her, but she disappeared. Did you see the defendant after 1.30 a.m.? You notice that Paul has returned. He approaches you. Paul Colley sits down next to you. Here's the dirt on... Uh, da, 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 da. Julian Masters, chief. He moved to L.A. from Berkeley a few years ago. He's worked at various odd jobs, from carpentry to animal training at the Barstow Kennels. He married Suzanne, who introduced him to Victor Cap and to her father's money. Julian used his wife's money to invest in the Argos Cafe with Victor. But now he's losing money. People are saying that Victor sold out his share in the Argos. Julian could have gone un under. Paul, investigate Suzanne. Okay, Chief, I'm on my way faster than you could say Jack Robinson. In one fluid motion, Paul lifts himself out of his seat and makes for the door. Della, call Barstow. Ella nods, grabs a pad of pencil, then leaves the courtroom. And then we'll let Burns answer. No, sir. He didn't see her. Not until the cops took her away. All the other exits out of the building were securely locked, so she couldn't have snuck out without me seeing her. Burger turns toward the jury. A calculated grin gently lifts across his face. Did other people enter the building around the time of the murder? No, sir, Mr. Berger. The defendant was the only guest registered in the building at the time of the murder. Ed smiles broadly and confidently. Ed, did Laura look suspicious to you? Objection. What grounds leading the witness? Objection, Sister Hamilton Berger walks mostly to his seat. No further questions. 
Okay. My turn. Okay. Why have you been arrested? As I start nervously around the courtroom, let me tell you something, Mr. Mason. I don't really have a record because I never did anything wrong. But before I started my job at the St. James Apartments, I got picked up by the police in connection with a uh, burglary ring. They let me go because they found out I had nothing to do with it. Della enters the courtroom and returns to her seat beside you. I don't know what to make of this. Chief Barso was kind of jumpy uh, da, 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 when I talked to him and he finally said he had to unburden his conscience about something. He told me Victor's dog Fritzy was personally trained by Suzanne. He also said Suzanne was the only person besides Victor who could handle the dog. It was trained to attack everyone else. I sent a messenger out to pick up an affidavit signed by Barstow about the dog. Della hands an affidavit from uh, Frank Barstow. Okay. Let me write that down. Because now we have a disposition, we have an affidavit, so we got to keep that straight. All right. All right. So, I just asked Burns why he has been arrested. So, let me see. Now, how many guess registered registered on Friday night uh, how many guess reg see if I can spell this correctly registered on Friday night. During my shift, 15 people entered the building, 6 were residents, and 9 were guests. Well, I think I only counted 7. So, introduce list as evidence. After laying the foundation for the evidence, you hand it to Berger, who looks at it briefly and gives it to the court reporter. Judge Northrop accepts this, the evidence and says this list is to be entered into the evidence. So we show the list. Ed's eyes widen at the sight of the guest list. Frown. Ed Burns is startled. How many guests Registered. So we got the music, that's a good thing. So look. I'm really not sure. I had a little nip and must have dozed off for a few minutes. Someone might have gone by. I, I was tired. That's all. It could ha have happened to anybody. I, I, Ed stops speaking and dejectly stares at the courtroom floor. The jury seems to be following your case with increased interest. After answering your question, Ed mops his brow with the handkerchief. And no further questions. Ah. All the jurors seem extremely interested in your case. Several of them see you looking in their direction and wave at you and Laura. Ha ha. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mason, says the district attorney with a sardonic grin. For my next witness, I'd like to call Mr. Russell Miller. Russell Miller lightly steps forward. He is a wiry man, no more than 5'6", with short black hair, olive skin, and thick glasses. He is impeccably dressed in a pinstripe suit, $150 Swiss shoes, silk necktie and handkerchief, and 18K gold cufflinks. He sits in the witness box and takes his oath impatiently. The district attorney approaches the witness box warily. For a moment, he... 
looks the witness over as if he could see right through Miller's glamorous facade. Russell, describe yourself to the court. Miller rolls his eyes in disbelief. Oh, let me look at my notes real quick. Okay. Okay. Miller rolls his eyes in disbelief. Oh, my name is Russell Miller. I am a freelance restaurant critic. I've been published in every important Los Angeles restaurant guide there is. I am also a very busy man, so let's not waste any time with trivial questions, shall we? Burger lashes out. Mr. Miller, as a witness, you are to answer the questions to the best of your ability, not to give us your uninformed opinion about how these proceedings should be run. Please confine your responses to what is being asked. Miller shrinks back from the district attorney's outburst, and Burger continues with his next question. Russell, did you know Victor? Sure, I knew him, sputters Miller. And we met at the Institute and since then circulated in the same social cliques. What Institute was that? Same Institute uh, uh, Laura was in? No. Anyway, we studied at the Culinary Institute of America. Miller replies in a dignified air. It, it is perhaps the finest chef school in the world. Russell, do you know Laura? From the back of the courtroom, you hear a door shut. You turn around to see Paul Drake returning. Get this, Perry. Suzanne Masters is loaded with money. Her family lives on a ranch outside of Palo Alto where her father raises horses and also keeps a collection of prize-winning show dogs. She met Julian while he was working at Barstow Kennels, which is where her father trains his dogs. After they got married, they moved to L.A. after the success of the Argo. Suzanne keeps herself busy by running a small fashion boutique out of the house. Oh. Answer. Okay, Miller answer, answers haughtily. Of course I know her. In fact, I was one of the first to know that she has been committed to an asylum. That sort of news travels quickly within our social circle. I'm sure you know how it is. Miller smugs, smiles smugly. <laughs> Did you socialize with Victor? Paul. Investigate. Margo. Okay, and then we'll let him answer. Oh, all the time. Heck, we're considered important people in our field. There's plenty of people that would love to entertain us. Did you conduct business with Victor? Uh, no, not in the last few years, Miller's grins weakly. weakly. Mm -hmm. Wonder why. Berger stands face to face with witness. Before answering the next question, Mr. Miller, I would like you to remind you that you are under. Russell Miller nods his head in right uh, recognition. Russell, was Victor faithful to the defendant? I think that's an objection. Yes, it is. Objection. On what grounds are you objecting, Mr. Mason? That's his opinion. That's an opinion, not a fact. Objection sustained. Did you see Victor on regular dates? I'll let him answer. I sure did for the last several months. Victor has been bringing Margot Dubois to nearly every social function he went to. Did Victor love Margot? Objection. What grounds? That's also an opinion. Objection sustained. District Attorney returns to a seat. Your witness, Counselor. All right. So, did you review the Argos? Question mark. I reviewed the Argos for Epicure Today magazine. I asked 
for the assignment since I was intrigued with the whole idea of a Greek Italian cafe. I mean, who but Victor Cap would think of combining the two? Uzo and Vino normally just don't mix, if you know what I mean. Anyway, the food was bad and the service even worse. It was the last review I wrote for that magazine. I left because of professional differences with the editor. It had nothing to do with Victor. Uh-huh, I'm gonna frown on that. Yeah, Russell takes notice. Introduce disposition as evidence. Deposition as evidence. After laying the foundation of evidence, blah, 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 the dispositions now show deposition. All right, Miller reads the deposition as a blood drains from his face. All right, Mason, I confess. I deliberately panned the Argos, even though the food was tremendous. I just really couldn't stand Victor Cap. Everything came so effortlessly to him. I get kicked out of cook cooking school, and he graduated graduates first in his class. He treated me like a worm, Mason. His personality was as rotten as his talent was great. I'm glad he's dead, Mason. I didn't kill him, but I'm glad he's dead. Russell looks down at his watch. And... Frown. I will frown again. Russell takes notice. Did you review the Argos? He already said he did. I guess I can't hide it any longer. Sometime last year I reviewed the Argos Cafe. It was awful. When I handed in my review to the editor, he couldn't believe I was going to give the Argos a bad review. He asked me to reconsider, but I was stupid. Victor read the review a week later, then went to the magazine's publisher and insisted he fire me. He did. I haven't been able to get a review published in any magazine since then. All right. Frown. I'm going to frown again. Russell is startled. Do you gamble? face twists in frustration. What? I mean, but, ah, uh, who cares? I gamble, Mr. Mason. I've gambled ever since I was fired from the magazine, and like most gamblers, I'm in debt from time to time. Lately, I've hit a bad streak, and I'm in debt to Ray Madison, but I'll cover the debts, Mr. Mason. All I need is a little more time. If you're implying that I owed Victor any money, I can assure that I most certainly did not. Russell sinks into his chair. His eyes dart around the courtroom. All right. Frown. Russell is startled. Describe your alibi. Okay, okay. I'll tell you where I was. My wife and I went to the Flamingo Club around 1 a.m. I left her at the table, then went to meet Ray Masson, the club's owner. I owed him money, and I got to step away for a little bit. I'll be right back. Mike off.
Mike on. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so he gave his alibi. Let's see. No further questions. Haha, -ha, look at how the jury is reacting to me now. All right, Burger stands up and scans the courtroom. For my next witness, I would like to call Mr. Julian Masters. The first thing that strikes you about Julian Masters as he walks towards the stand is his size. He has the broad shoulders and the barrel chest of a football player. His expensive taste in clothes and his conservative haircut, however, belial and acquired geniality. He takes his oath solemnly. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, all right. Let's continue. Julian, when did you become a business partner of Victor's? Julian Masters speaks in a smooth, calling voice. I formed my partnership with Mr. Cap approximately five years ago. How did you become partners? Victor persuaded me to provide some financial backing for his daring, somewhat unconfessional cafe. I'm not easily persuaded, but there was something compelling in the way he spoke. It was as if he had a vision. While we were partners, Victor and I worked very closely. Did you know about the defendant's illness? Masters looks somewhat surprised by the question. Why, certainly, Counselor. Admittedly, I am not very close to Laura, but it is inconceivable that such an unfortunate occurrence in Victor's life would escape my attention. Victor confided in me often when his wife's condition got the better of him. The district attorney pivots towards the witness. Would the defendant threaten Mr. Cap? Objection. <sighs> <laughs> it would help if I spelled it correctly. Objection. And that would be an opinion. I will sustain that. Did you see Victor on Friday afternoon? From the back of the courtroom, you hear a door shut and turn around and see Paul Drake returning. All right, let me see here. Perry, Margo is one tough nut to crack. There is nothing on her before she started working at the Argos. No birth certificate, no social security number, not even a bank account. I couldn't even find her address, but a woman says she sees a lot of, uh, yeah. A lot of Margot around the St. James Apartments. As far as I can tell, Margot spends her evenings hours at Brannigan's, a town town bar. Okay, so Della, call Brannigan. Della nods, grabs a pad and pencil, then leaves the courtroom. Answer the question. Yes, he and I were going over some documents concerning our partnership. Berger stares intently at Julian asks, Julian, was Victor having an affair? Objection. What grounds? That's an opinion. I will sustain that objection, Counselor, said the judge. Was Victor expecting the defendant's visit? Let me check my notes. Objection. That's leading. Uh, Oops. <laughs> uh, okay, let's try this again. Objection. Leading. I will sustain that. Burger mutters angrily to himself, then turns to Judge Northa. Permit me to rephrase the question, Your Honor. Burger then returns his attention to the witness. Julian, did Victor Cap talk about the defendant? Yes, yes, I spoke quite a bit about her. What did he say? He told me that he was saddened that his marriage had fallen apart while Laura has been institutionalized. He knew that Laura would be fierce when she eventually found him. All right. 
Berger mutters to himself on the way back to his seat and turns to you. You're a witness, Counselor. You notice that Della has returned. She quietly sits down next to you. I think we're onto something, Chief. Mr. Brangan said he did see Margot Dubois on the night of the murder. She apparently arrived... Sometime around midnight, Brannigan says she was very angry and upset. She started to drink heavily, then confided in Brannigan that she hated Victor. She left at 1245. After making a phone call, Brannigan claims he tried to convince her to hail a cab, but she refused. She said she'd rather walk. Okay, now it's my turn to ask the questions. All right, so describe... The Argos. The Argos sports a very good reputation within many exclusive social circles. The restaurant's popularity is due to a lot of hard work and a few big financial risks. There's a lot of money invested in that restaurant, Mr. Mason. Okay. Describe your partnership with Victor. Victor and I worked well as partners. We didn't socialize together very often, but the best proof of our business relationship was the success of the Argos. Okay, introduce in tro deuce document as evidence. Okay, and then show the document. Julian looks uncomfortably at the document. Yes, Victor was selling out his share of the Argos to me. Without his name and reputation, though, the future of the Argos was uncertain. Okay, I'm going to frown. Julian takes notice. Describe your partnership with Victor. A nervous grin creeps across Julian's face. Okay, Counselor, I'll tell you the truth. My relationship with Victor was occasionally very volatile. He had no idea how to budget, and I was always fighting with him to let me balance the books. He always replied that nothing, not even money, should stand in the way of cooking. Okay. Let me see. Describe your marriage. Ah. Describe your marriage. Mr. Mason, Susan and I have been happily married for years. If you are insinuating that my wife was having an affair with my partner, you are wrong. Dead wrong. Introduce... Earring as evidence. After the land, da da, earring is entered into evidence. Frown. Oh. Show earring. Looks just like the one of a pair I bought for Suzanne. Frown. Julian is startled. Describe your marriage. I didn't know exactly what was going on between my wife and my esteemed partner, he sneered, but I was determined to find out. Several weeks ago, I tailed Suzanne in my car, and her trail led me to the St. James Apartments. I was so angry I could... I could Masters breaks down in tears. Okay. Wait. The witless looks more composed. Dis. Gribe your alibi. Suzanne and I came home at 10 o'clock, all right. But then we went to our separate rooms. You see, we haven't been sleeping together for the last six months. Julian's shoulders sag as he buries his face into his hands. 
No further questions. I made the big football looking guy cry. One look and you realize that you have the jury in the palm of your hand. That's right. As I go back to my desk, I give the jury high fives and woot woots and yeah, we're going to win this case. The prosecution would now like to call the wife of Julian Masters, Suzanne Masters. Suzanne Masters saunters up to the witness box. She is dressed simply yet elegantly. Her keen, steady eyes radiate a smiling welcome to the world at large while continuously studying and surrounding, evaluating her surroundings. Do you know the defendant? Suzanne takes a deep breath. Certainly, Laura and I are as close as two friends could be. Sure, while you're sleeping with her husband. Why, even when she was in the hospital, I frequently visit her. Sure. Let me look at my notes. Here we go. All right. Berger approaches the witness. Now, Mrs. Masters, we all realize that the temptation to protect your closest friend by not telling the entire truth is great. May I remind you that you are under oath and that any willful giving of false information will constitute perjury. Suzanne nods gravely. Did you see the defendant on Friday? Yes, I did. She came over to the house around 2.30 in the afternoon. <coughs> Excuse me. Berger turns to the courtroom, walks a few steps back, then whirls back to Suzanne. Did the defendant have a gun? Objection! You're leading the witness. Point well taken, counselor. Objection sustained, agrees the judge. Berger pauses until his anger passes, then resumes questioning. What was the, def what was the defendant carrying? Suzanne bites her lip. Well, I saw that she had. She had a gun in her purse. Berger points to the gun on the evidence on the table. Did you see this gun in the Laura's purse? Suzanne hesitates for a moment, then looks curiously at the revolver. Yes, I'm sure that's the one. Suzanne bows her head. Did you talk with the defendant? Oh, of course I did, Suzanne snaps angrily. My goodness, Mr. Berger, do you think she came over just to borrow a cup of sugar? The district attorney drills into the witness. Mrs. Masters, I remind you to answer the question succinctly and directly without any extraneous comments or opinions. Suzanne begins to speak, but Berger cuts her off before she utters a word. Did the defendant talk about her husband's affair? Yes. What did the defendant say about the affair? She said that Victor was definitely having an affair with someone. It was She was convinced that it was with Margot Dubois. Poor Laura was beside herself. Naturally, I felt awful for her. The district attorney turns around the jury box. Uh, Mrs. Masters, as the defendant's closest friend, you must be a good judge of her character and behavior. Suzanne stares coldly into the district attorney's eyes. How did the defendant look to you? Objection. Uh, opinion. Point well taken. Describe Laura's behavior. To be honest, Mr. Berger, I wouldn't know exactly how to describe it except to say that it was peculiar. She kept muttering to herself, and when I'd asked her what she had just said she would look at me strangely as if she didn't remember saying anything I was I was very worried about her okay Berger returns to his seat his face beat red your witness counselor all right describe your alibi let's go for the throat there 
I did leave the house for a bit. I went to a pharmacy to pick up a newspaper for Julian. Unfortunately, nobody saw me, so I can't say I have an airtight alibi. Describe your relationship with Victor. Very well, Mr. Mason Suzanne. It's as if you really want to know. I'll tell you. Yes, Victor and I were having an affair. We met the first month Victor came out to L.A., months before I met Julian. I loved him, but he was so unpredictable, and so I went for the security that Julian could offer me. But I never really got over Victor, and it didn't take much convincing on his part that we should still see, that we should still see each other. All right, frown. I'm going to frown at that. Suzanne is startled. Introduce. Deuce. Affidavit. As evidence. Okay, it's an evidence. Show the affidavit. Yes, it's true. I was the only one besides Victor who could handle Fritzy. <coughs> Suddenly, Suzanne bursts into tears and buries her face in her hand. I can't stand it anymore. I killed him. I murdered Victor Cap. After a few moments, Suzanne looks towards you. Her face tightened with resolve. Her wet cheeks smeared with mascara. Mr. Mason, it was awful. Before I go to jail, I like to tell my story. May I? Well, I'm not going to defend you, so yeah, go ahead. I was with Victor on the night that Laura visited. After Julian went to sleep, I drove to the St. James. The doorman was asleep, so I walked by him and went straight up to Victor's apartment. We sat in the living room for a while, see, there were two drinks there, drinking wine and planning our future together. Fritzy was out of her pen since we both knew how to control her. Victor expected Laura's visit and he promised me that he'd tell her he was filing for a divorce. When Laura came, I disappeared into the bedroom. I couldn't see what was happening, but I could hear some of the conversation. I heard Victor tell her he loved her. I heard him try to calm her and beg her forgiveness. I thought my world was collapsing around me. First, he was going to ruin my husband. Yeah, first he was going to ruin my husband, and then he was going to dump me. A commotion broke out in the living room. It sounded like Fritzy was attacking Laura. That dog always hated her. I heard a shot and I ran out. I was livid by this time. I found her passed out on the floor and Victor running for the phone. I saw the gun on the floor. It looked like Laura had tried to shoot Fritzy but fell back on the stairs and fired a bullet into the ceiling instead. I remember using a tissue from my pocket to cover the gun's handle. He never knew who shot him. I was remarkably calm at that at the time. I put the gun back near Laura, but by the time I reached Fritzy, Fritzy, her paws were covered with Victor's blood. I cleaned her as best I could, put her in her pen, and I and went to my own apartment. I lived ever since with the realization that Laura might have been threatening him with a gun when he was trying to calm her and tell her he still loved her. Susan breaks down in tears. A stunned silence grips the courtroom. Julian watches speechlessly as Suzanne is taken into custody by the police. Laura begins to sob uncontrollably. As Judge Northrop adjourns the case, you turn around to see Lieutenant Tregg behind you. Congratulations, Mason. You've cracked the case of the Mandarian murder. How did you do it? Uh, you explained to Tregg that the existence of Victor's blood in the dog pen meant that someone had put Fritzy there after the murder. But if Fritzy was as vicious as everyone said, only someone familiar. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, someone familiar with the animal could have done so. Once you discovered that Suzanne had trained Fritzy, the case was as good as solved. I suppose I shouldn't have doubted you for a minute, Mason, but unfortunately that's my job. You return Trey's warm handshake. Realizing that you have done more than just serve justice, you've 
earned yourself that vacation you promised Della you'd take. You smile knowing that Della is already home changing for tonight's cele celebratory dinner. Case closed. it that was the perry mason and the case of the mandria murder uh hope you liked it i liked it it was good memory for me uh you know hit uh if you liked it hit the like button uh hit hit the notification button definitely so you know when i upload a new uh video and uh take it easy i hear my wife calling me in the background gotta go bye mike off